Well, good afternoon, church. It is always a great delight when, as a church body, particularly in the summers, we have so many old members uh, show up, those who were with us but uh, left to go overseas, or those who were with us and are now at another church. Uh, not just Jeffrey, but Solomon Glinton are here. In fact, if you were, you used to be at Grace, but uh, for one reason or another, you're, you're not, but you're here now today. Just stand up that we can see who you are and acknowledge you as well. That would be you, uh, Jem and Jade and... There we go. All right. All right. Welcome, welcome, welcome. All right. You've been enjoying the Olympic Games. Phenomenal stuff. Phenomenal stuff. Boy, have you seen some of the videos they've got up of Bahamians and Banks and so forth when the 4x4 four four team won. Pandemonium. Pandemonium. I think we all thought, we all thought the Bahamas was going to come away medalists. They only went to spectate and see how others do uh, athletics. And so when we went on vacation to London, yes. So when that happened, it was a joy for the whole country. Amen? Yeah. You know, sadly, today is the ending of the uh, two weeks of the Olympics. We're winding down. And uh, tonight, of course, you know, would be the closing out ceremony. What a week it's been. Athleticism at its best. You know, you know, yesterday afternoon in the dentist's office, my kids and I were at the dentist's office for most of the, the day. Um, you know, with my daughter being off, got to make sure everything is, is, is right. And parents, doesn't it get to you how these children always find in some way to make you spend money? Every time you spin around, they will use the teeth you gave them. I, oh, Lord, have mercy. Anyway. Uh, oh, yeah, they believe. They got the money tree out, out there somewhere that they believe you just go to when you need it. Now I know what mom is always talking about. Boy, I tell you, mom used to say growing up, you know what? Parents' best revenge is when their children have children. <laughs> boy, do I know what she means. Oh, boy, do I know what she means. The thing is, she only had two. I got four. So you, you know I know what she means. <laughs> All right. You know, yesterday afternoon, as I was saying, we're in the doctor's office, and I watch the, um, the 20K speed walking. Anyone else watch that? I watched the whole thing. Because I mean, what else are you doing in the dentist's office, right? They had this amazing lady from Russia. This, this, this race, the fastest, is one hour and 25 minutes. I watched one hour and 25 minutes of speed walking. I mean, that's a funky walk. Anyone seen that? That's a funky walk. Um, but I watched that, and there was this lady. She was winning for one, for one hour and 22 minutes. I mean, 10 laps, nine, nine and three quarters of the last lap she is winning. Just, just for one, at one point, she's a minute ahead of the competition. You know how far that is? But in that last, I would say the last maybe nine, 900 meters, this girl began to gain on her, gain on her, gain on her. And just before they hit that yellow piece that maybe is the last 100 meters, she passed her. Oh, it broke my heart. I was praying, Lord, Lord, give us, give us the strength, give us the strength, give us the strength. But she passed her and went on out. That was a Russian teammate, so, I mean, Russia still got gold and silver. But it was heartbreaking because she started off strong. Strong. You said she's just going to blow the competition away because she was just kept on gaining. I just thought, you know, from the top up, it looked like she was running. When they showed you the legs, there was that awkward hip-swinging leg gyrate. Oh, it's just, just insane. But, you know, it was a perfect illustration of starting strong, but not, a, not being able to finish strong. And there's a better illustration than that that I want to give. Today, with our college students about to go off, and as we celebrate the 80th birthday of Marjorie Trico, and as I thought about what could we say that would put all these things together and be a word to us, I felt the presence of mind to present this powerful message I heard some time ago as God's word to us about finishing strong. 
We take up the story of one such man of God who started strong but finished badly. The story of King Solomon, son of King David, as chronicled in the books of Kings and First Chronicles. And our text begins in 1 Kings 3, 10 through 13, where we read, So Solomon made this request of God. Now let me set it up for you. Of course, Solomon has become king in the place of his father, uh, David, and he's just overwhelmed with, how can I be a king over these great people? He makes this powerful, powerful prayer. He says, O Lord my God, now you have made me king instead of my father, David. But I am like a child who doesn't know his way around. And here I am among your own chosen people, a nation so great that they are too numerous to count. Give me, therefore, an understanding mind that I can govern your people well and know the difference between right and wrong. For who by himself is able to govern this nation of yours? Father, we ask that your spirit would give us wisdom, discernment, understanding, courage, and the knowledge to know how we can apply the truth as I understand. Therefore, we present ourselves to you for instruction. Pray that you would speak through me to us, to all of us, that we may receive instruction that we may live by. To this end, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And the Bible gives us God's answer to that great prayer. Since you ask for this, says the Lord, and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have you asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment in administering justice, I will do what you've asked. Oh, can you imagine how glorious that must have been to get that word from the Lord? I will do what you've asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that there will never be anyone like you, nor will there ever be again. I say, Lord, man, why do you say that? I mean, I, I want to. I am in the place of Solomon too. I want a discerning heart to lead the people of God, not just the people of God, the nation of the Bahamas. I want to have a discerning heart where... Um, we can speak into the lives of people and see them changed by the transforming word of God that I spoke about last week. Praise the Lord. The Bible says we have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ by which we are able to minister and deliberate. God says, moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both riches and honor, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. Brothers and sisters, Solomon started strong. He was humble, and he knew he needed to depend on God to succeed. How about you? Do you know you need to depend on God to succeed? Did you notice some of those athletes gave all honor to God in succeeding? Did you notice that? Some, some didn't, but some did. They recognize God has given them their ability. If we had time, I'd go into a number of illustrations, but no time today. Solomon also had a great prayer life. One of the most beautiful and powerful prayers ever prayed can be found in 1 Kings 8, 22 through 30. When the building of the temple was complete, Solomon had the priests bring the ark into the holy place. And when the priests withdrew from the holy place, the glory of the Lord filled the temple in a great cloud. And you know, the people had to rush out because God's presence falling in that place was so awesome. Solomon had started strong. He was humble. He knew he needed to depend on God. He had a great prayer life. He had the influence of a good father. In 1 Kings 2, 1 through 3, Solomon was born in the home of King David. Now, David was not a perfect man. We all know his story. He made mistakes, but God said this of David, and he hasn't said it to any of us. He is a man after my own heart. I don't imagine higher words can be given to anyone. Solomon had a man of God as a father. Now, fathers are important to the raising of children. Not only is it important to have a father, but it's also important to have a father that is a good man. To be fortunate enough to be born into a home where the father is present and where the father is also a good man is to begin life with a good start. But Solomon didn't just start off strong, being humble, knowing he needed to depend on God, having a good prayer life, having a good father. But Solomon did great things for God. During the fourth year as king, the construction of the Lord's temple began. And what a project it was. The temple was 90 feet long, 30 feet wide, and 45 feet high. Tens of thousands of people were involved in this seven-year project. He used 4,000 tons of pure gold plus 40,000 tons of silver. 
the value of this gold and silver would be valued at $60 billion, not counting bronze, iron, precious stones, cedar, wood, and labor. In fact, if you were to include that, they say the figures come to $100 billion. You get the idea of what that temple must have looked like? Just to compare to today, the construction of this Temple of Solomon's cost $100 billion. Just compare that to today's the Freedom Tower at the World Trade Center that is expected to be completed at a cost of $2 billion. I don't know if those figures have changed in the, in the interim of the time I acquired these figures. $100 billion to $2 billion. You can see how awesome that, that um, the intention of that is to be compared to uh, Solomon's Temple. Yes, yeah, Solomon did great things for God. Not only that, Solomon wrote a couple of great books, bestsellers. Solomon is the author of three books, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon, it is believed. Solomon had many advantages, many good things going for him. Like many of our college students heading off to college, good background, good fathers, good things happening in your life. You've done many things for the Lord, gone on mission trips, done good things. But take a warning from the life of Solomon. Solomon finished badly. Solomon finished badly. Don't finish badly. Don't let the things that have been entrusted to you fall to the ground. Don't take them as suggestions for your life. Take them as the principles by which you will live so you don't finish badly. I think you would agree with me that Solomon had a good start based on the things I've just reminded you of. But his finish was lousy. It is this great start that makes it so hard to understand his lousy finish. Solomon did not finish strong. He finished in a terrible way. Here's what the Lord had to say. The Lord was very angry with Solomon for his heart had turned away from the Lord. His heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. My gosh, the Lord appeared to you twice. The Lord has spoken to you personally. And his heart still turned away from the Lord. He had warned Solomon specifically about worshiping other gods, but Solomon did not listen to the Lord's command. So now the Lord said to him, since you have not kept my covenant and have disobeyed my laws, I will surely Tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your servants. And scripture goes on to say that if it wasn't for David and his loyalty to God, God would have ripped the kingdom out of Solomon's hand during his own lifetime. But only because his father was David, God says, you know what? I'm going to spare you the humiliation. I'm going to let it happen during the time of your son. Give it your kingdom to your servants. Greatest kingdom on planet earth ever. I'm going to rip it out of your hands because you have proved unfaithful and walked away from the living God. This is what I'm talking about. Finishing strong is more important than starting strong. You have just watched the Olympic Games and I don't know anything else that puts such an exclamation on what I'm saying. You watched it again and 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 again. People training for four years, four years, four years of practice, four years of giving everything up so you can be the best. Some people just, they can't finish. Or something gets in the way and they don't finish. They don't finish well. No trophy for them. Solomon went from being God's man to having God tear the kingdom from his hands. And the only reason God didn't do it, as I said, because of who his father was. You see, Solomon might have tried to say, Lord, don't, don't do this, see, because I did these good things for you. I did this and I did that and, and I built a temple and I wrote three books of the Bible that are, I mean, they're not just three good books, they're in the Bible. God, they're in the Bible. You, 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 what? you can't do this to me. You, you can't do this to me. I'm a man. I, I built the temple for God's sake. 
Three books of the Bible bear my name. God! The only reason it didn't happen in his lifetime is because God remembered his father. Those things don't really matter now because a good start isn't enough in the eyes of God. Solomon was going down, and he was going down hard because of his lousy finish. Everyone cheers the runners at the start of the race, but the real race is fought and won on the back roads where not many see and few cheer, and that is where many choose to quit, and they never make it to hear the cheers at the finish line because they cheated somewhere, because they lost their way somewhere. You see, friends, your real Christian faith is not fought in the public eye. It's in those little moments where nobody sees, nobody knows that the real you becomes who you are. You see, it's when no one is watching you looking at that pornography late at night. No one sees that, but you know it begins to affect your marriage. And it begins to affect your view of women. And pretty soon you perhaps slipped into another relationship. And pretty soon that nature of yours that was always pure and honest has to lie now to cover up a wretched life. You see, folks, never mind what you are now. It's how you will finish. You need to be careful what you do when no one else can see you. That's where the real you, the real you comes alive, comes to life. The real you. Be careful of living for the applause of men. Be careful of needing the favor of men. Oh, it's great to have it. But friends, sometimes it's not there. College kids, listen to me. Lots of times, lots of times I could have done wrong. And I had plenty help and pr plenty provocation to do wrong. But always I knew who I served. I knew whose I was. Man, I turned away from Christianity so hard at the age of 10 when God brought me back at 17. You better believe I was convinced. I know, I knew who I believed and I was persuaded. Persuaded. Telling you, you must be persuaded. Because the devil has your number. He knows what you think in secret. He knows where you are on certain issues. And he says, God, now you were out here bragging about so-and-so. Let me have my time attesting. Let me have my time attesting. You were out here bigging them up. Come. Let, let me test them. We'll see just how strong their faith is. So never mind your strong start here at Grace College students. Never mind. You must finish well. You must know what you believe. You must be persuaded. There's nothing else out there better than the life that's been given to you. Nothing. And there's no one worth you separating yourself from Christ for. Ain't no man out there, ladies. Ain't no woman out there, men. They don't exist. And grass ain't green on the other side. Hold on to Jesus. Hold on to him. Boy, he ain't done me wrong in the 32 years I served him. What I recognized the other day, August 1st came by, and I, I missed it by a day. I said, how, first time in my 32 years, I did not realize this is the day I came to faith. Now, Brother Vaughn, please stand up. I thank God for this brother, Sister Deneen. Stand up, where are you? Brother Trico and Aunt Marjorie, stand up for me. So grateful for this family. When I was unconvinced of the claims of Christ, Deneen Trico was bold enough to say, boy, you need Jesus. Bold statement for someone who had it all. I tell her, come from Romney. Jeff could testify. Come from Romney talking foolishness. I wouldn't listen to her. She sick her big brother Vaughn and Timothy on me, but Vaughn was persistent. Timothy said, this fellow's hard not to crack. I give up on him. Vaughn wouldn't let me go, wouldn't let me go, wouldn't let me go. Night after night after night, every day of the summer, he, he persevered. And God used his words with me. And then I was also the time in the home of the Tricos, and I, I, I watched real Christian character up at work, up close and personal. And that made an impact. And so I am a Christian today. I am the senior pastor of Grace today because the good example set the challenge that came out of that home to challenge me. And I'm grateful to God for it. Amen? Amen. But I must be careful 
to make sure I finish strong. Never mind the strong start. I must finish strong as you must. Why did disaster strike in the life of Solomon? It tells us because he stopped walking in the ways of the Lord. He stopped walking in the ways of the Lord. First thing, students. First thing. Get involved with the church. First thing. First thing. First thing. Say it with me. First thing I'm going to do is get involved with the church. First thing I'm going to do is get involved with the church. If you can't find a church, find a Christian group like Navigators, Campus Crusade. Get involved with them. They know what a good church is. They've been there for years. They know where they are. You've got to get in with the church right away because those people are going to keep you accountable. Call you and keep you accountable. Call you and tell you, listen, no one looking. Do this with me. But you get involved with the church, you get involved with church people, they're going to watch your back. That's a home to eat in. There are people to watch over you. You've got to get involved. Solomon stopped walking with the Lord. Solomon married many foreign women, hundreds of them, in fact, and they were not just not followers of God, they worshipped idols and influenced him to do the same. He built altars and shrines to these other gods. So here it is. He built this wonderful temple to God. But you know what? He built, who knows, scores, maybe, maybe hundreds of te smaller temples for his wives. So the good of building that temple was long since eradicated. The first uh, false temple he built for these idols. He had good father, received good advice, was humble and dependent on God, had a great prayer life, did good things for God, and even wrote three good books that made it into the Bible. But in the end, we find the Lord became angry with Solomon and tore the kingdom away from him. Why? Because he no longer walked in the ways of the Lord. Be careful, friends, when, I like how Pastor Hannah says all the time, you work your way out of a blessing. You can work your way out of a blessing. I don't intend to do that. And I trust that none of us has to do that either. Solomon also allowed other things in his life to replace God. He allowed other things in his life to replace God. It happens still today. Many start strong and are passionate about God, but somewhere along the line, God gets replaced by some idol. Maybe it is a pursuit of money, or compromising by dating or marrying a non-Christian, a boyfriend or girlfriend. Oh, for God's sake, there's nothing, nothing I know anywhere that takes good, solid Christian young men, Christian young women away from God, than that. That's why you hear me say from this pulpit all the time, don't talk no foolishness to me about you and love with no one. Don't start there with me, because I'm already hot. You don't fall in love with someone. That's Hollywood. You find out who someone is. Find out who they are. What are their values? What are their beliefs? What are they about? And then learn to see if you can like them. Nonsense about you fall in love with someone. I can tell you right now, Cyril Pete is more in love with Ramona Pete than, uh, today than he was the day he married her. And I can tell you, because I was there, he did like a plenty. Back in, back in uh, 81. Talk to me, Pete. Talk to me. Huh? You can testify, my Lord. And so it is. I see she snatched right up on you. Sometimes you swear some of these people are the only people who got wife in the church, eh? <laughs> my Lord, I tell you. Go on, my brother. Praise the Lord. Many people have lost their way by getting hitched up and hooked up with the wrong person. Paul was concerned about finishing strong in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27. When Paul came to Christ, he blew out of the tracks. Hussein bolt light. Blew out of the tracks. I mean, he was gone faster than anyone could ever conceive of. Wait a minute. This the fellow who was persecuting the church the other day? This him here? But Paul knew that there was more to a race than the start. Here's what he said. Listen to his own words in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27. In a race, everyone runs, but only one gets the first prize. So run your race to win, college students. Run your race to win, grace members. Run to win. To win the contest, you must deny yourselves many things that would keep you from doing your best. I wonder how much denial of personal pleasure takes place at Grace Community Church. I can tell you, as I judge the spiritual temperature, I don't believe much denial goes on. Hello. Friends, there's no growth in Christ without denial. All right, I'm a little hard now. All right. 
There is no growth in Christ without a denial. Like Paul, there must be, I consider all things as lost for the sake of Christ. More than that, I consider them dung. The stuff left in the toilet after you've sat there for a while. I consider all things, prestige, honor. Consider it nonsense for the sake of Christ. You know why he says that? Because all those things kept him from recognizing Christ when he came. Be careful what you value, because that can keep you from Christ. Students, don't make the mistake of being the smartest person in the Bahamas with no morals. We're not interested in smarter crooks in this country. You can go to the bank and outwit anyone and get more money for the bank through some crooked, devious means. Not interested in that. We need, in this bankrupt, morally bankrupt company, we need some upright, godly persons in all the industries of our country. Paul says, to win the contest, you must deny yourself many things that would keep you from doing your best. An athlete goes to all this trouble just to win a blue ribbon or a silver cup. But we do it for a heavenly reward that never disappears. So I run straight to the goal with a purpose in every step. I fight to win. I'm not just shadow boxing or playing around like an athlete. I punish my body. I deny my body its appetites. I deny my body those things that will bring me to ruin. Some of you need to heed me. I deny some, some of you, you know, you get a little bit lonely and you go on the way of Lord knows what. Some of you, you're a little bit broken, you go the way of Balaam. Listen, nothing is worth the price of your soul purchased by precious blood. Nothing else. No man can bring greater comfort than the arm, being in the arms of the eternal God who loved you and gave himself up at Calvary that he might redeem you. No money should purchase your soul. We have seen with our own eyes a pastor purchased by gambling money speak foolishness in the public realm. Careful what you value because it can buy your soul. Paul says, like an athlete, I punish my body, treating it roughly, training it to do what it should, not what it wants to. Otherwise, I fear that after enlisting others for the race, I myself might be declared unfit and ordered to stand aside. Paul feared that for all that he did, God would say, no, 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 no. Get away from me. I want nothing to do with you. Can you imagine? If you think Solomon wrote three books, this fellow wrote how much? How much books Paul wrote? About 17? Y'all, someone excuse my memory. Uh, seminarians among us. Brother Vaughan, how much? About, let's go with 17 just to be safe. We stand to be corrected. All right. 13 seems more like that, more than that. But anyway. Um, but Paul was concerned about finishing strong. A good start isn't enough in the eyes of God. A good start and past victories do not make up for a lousy finish. If Solomon could not coast in on the ways of his good start, we dare not think that we can either. We can't. A good start is important, yes. It's important getting out of the blocks fast, yes. But trophies are given only to those who cross the finish line. Have you noticed that? In that same um, 50K race, a judge would step into the middle in front of a run and hold up a, a yellow card. Bam, get out. No, yellow was saying, you got a warning. Next time, bam, red card. No, you could be in mid-stride, you're over. Get out. You have to get off the, off the track because you're disqualifying. So if Solomon could not coast, neither can we. The Bible is full of stories of men and women who had great starts for God but did not finish strong. Brothers and sisters, 12 spies were sent by Moses to spy out the promised land, and only two finished strong, Caleb and Joshua. The other 10 had a lousy finish, but they all started strong. They were leaders chosen among the millions of Israelites. These were Israel's best and brightest chosen for this assignment. They weren't rookies. They had a proven track record. They were leaders. They were courageous. They were warriors. They started strong, but finished badly. Numbers 13. And they died like refuse in the desert over the 40 years that would follow. Then there was King Saul, Noah's sons, Eli the high priest. They all started strong but didn't finish strong. 
The fact that good man, godly man, faithful man, men like Solomon, the ten spies, Saul, the high priest Eli, Gideon, and Samson, the fact that men who were on fire, men who flew out of the starting blocks, men who had a commanding half-time lead, finished poorly, put a godly fear in Paul. And it puts a godly fear in me as well. It puts a godly fear in me as well. We are capable of finishing badly. We must hold on to Jesus so that doesn't happen. We must let his Holy Spirit sift us so that there's nothing that we are not prepared to let go of to become all that he would have us to be. So how do we make sure we finish strong? How can you and I ensure that we cross the finish line with power? We need to have staying power, brothers and sisters. Who of us can forget the incredible smiles of Mo Farah and his finishing kick in the 10K and then later on the 5K? That's the one smile all the time going like this. From Great Britain? That guy? What a kick! These guys are sprinting. Having ran 10K, these guys are sprinting. Some of us can't run four 100 meters and have any energy to kick. This guy's got a kick. So how do we finish as we wind down? How can we get to the finish line with a kick? First thing, stay away. Stay away. Stay away from things that slow you down. Stay away from people that slow you down. Paul says we should get rid of, uh, of anything that encumbers and the sin which so easily entangles. Stay away. Know what brings you down. Know what brings you down. Realize what your weaknesses are and be smart enough to stay away from them. Stop playing strong. No one benefits you trying to play strong. No. No. And some of you try to play strong in the one thing you ought not to play strong in. The Bible says when it comes to sexual temptation, run. Say, so don't have no Bible study. Don't, don't memorize no scripture. Get out of Dodge. Get out of Dodge. Some of you, oh, well, you know, I have memorized the scripture. I'm, I remember when we used to quote uh, the Corinthian passage, no temptation has taken you except what is common to man. You know, I, I can stand. No, it says, and God will provide a way of escape so that you can stand. And so we need to be careful thinking we're strong in an area that has brought down untold billions. King Solomon is exhibit A. Well, you know my routine, but we ain't got time for that. I can tell you about all the men in the Bible and how, what brought them down. You know them. All right, Paul says, flee youthful lust. Rather than think you can handle strong temptation, stay away from it. Uh, secondly, staying away from your weak areas will help you to finish strong. Uh, thirdly, stay focused. Don't get distracted by other things. It is going to take endurance to finish strong. Be willing to deny yourself when you want to quit or give up. Tell yourself to keep on pressing on. Don't give up. Remind yourself about the reward that is waiting for you. Have you seen the commercial? I'm not sure if it's City, uh, City um, uh, Bank or whatever, but uh, uh, you just see the hands of someone diving into the water, and he says, I haven't seen a movie in two years. And then you see a guy on the, on the um, high bar saying, uh, I haven't ordered dessert in, what, nine months. And then you see a lady riding a bike saying, you know that good book everybody's talking about? I haven't read it yet. And it's all about athletes realizing they have to deny themselves. They have to deny themselves these things that are considered pleasure if they're going to achieve their goal. It's endurance that determines whether or not we will finish strong. Endurance is a fruit of godly character. The Christian life is not a hundred-yard dash, people. It's a marathon. It's a long race. And long races don't only require speed. They require grit, guts, determination, and finishing power. It's never too late, brothers and sisters, to begin doing what is right. As long as you're breathing, it is never too late to get back on track. It's never too late to repent from getting sidetracked. And stay in, stay close, stay away, and stay focused. It's never too late to confess your sin to the Lord in genuine repentance and receive his forgiveness. Shall we pray? Please stand. Perhaps you've messed up, and perhaps messed up really in a big way. Perhaps you're feeling that maybe God can't uh, use you now. Maybe you feel that you lack abilities. I think one of the greatest moments 
we saw during the Olympics was that of Oscar Pistorius, the double amputee who was allowed to run for the first time in the London Olympics. Oscar Pistorius, you may not know, is a believer. And he says that it was God who gave him the strength, who aids me in my struggles and makes my glories that much greater. Oscar Pistorius' example is an inspiration of those of us with physical challenges the world over. He said, I don't see myself as disabled. I just don't have lower legs. You're not disabled by the disabilities you have. You are able by the abilities you have. Brothers and sisters, you may not have Pistorius' challenges or capacities, but you have, you have problems and gifts that make you uniquely qualified to run the race God intends for you to run. And he called us all to run with perseverance the race marked out before us. So let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. The next time you think God cannot use you, do two things. Remember Oscar Pistor Pistorius. And secondly, fix your eyes on Jesus, who can get you through. As the, as the musicians are singing, I want to be more like Jesus. Take a moment. And I'm going to return to pray for us all that each of us would finish strong to the honor and glory of God. I want to be more.